Welcome back. Uh, if you remember from our last video, we discussed the physical, environmental, and historical geographies of Middle East, North Africa. Today we will discuss the economic, social, and political geographies of MENA. Uh, historically, MENA was at the center of education and trade between Europe and East Asia, making it one of the wealthiest regions in the world. However, the discovery of oil and the rise of colonialism in the late 1800s, early 1900s, led to a quick period of decline as most uh, European powers went scrambling for resources. Now this region began to recover in the 1970s for several reasons, but one of the important reasons was the combination of both independence and the exportation of oil. So as you can see from these graphs, I'll make this a little bit bigger so you get a better view of it. Uh, most countries in MENA have seen a substantial growth in GNI per capita from 1970 to 2010. Now the problem begins in 2013 when a series of government overthrows resulted in what became known as the Arab Spring, which we'll talk about later. Now because there are so many countries in this region, um, I split them into three subgroups. We have uh, North Africa, Middle East, and the Arabian Peninsula. Now, many of the Arab and North African countries uh, were able to take advantage of oil revenues after the creation of the petrodollar in the 1970s. Now, the petrodollar refers to the purchasing of oil internationally using U.S. dollars. This has effectively tied the value of the dollar to the price of oil, although there are other variables that affect the U.S. dollar as well. Now, the petrodollar began after Nixon ended the Bretton Woods Agreement and took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard. At the same time, Nixon signed an agreement with Saudi Arabia to sell their oil in U.S. dollars. Um, other Arab and North African states would, would eventually follow behind. Now, these countries had a direct impact on the value of the dollar and vice versa. Now, this brought a period of growth for many of these countries. Now, the economies in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle East countries on the graph on the right, over here, uh, had a more diverse economies, so many of these states had slower uh, but steadier growth. However, this is not the case for Kuwait, who was a major exporter of oil out of the Persian Gulf, as you can see here. But of course, uh, the same thing that happened to many other uh, uh, MENA states happened to Kuwait around 2013. Now Israel is uh, the anomaly in the Middle East um, as it has a major technology, military contractor, and pharmaceutical sector. It also has the benefit of being a U.S. ally. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these links and maybe we can get a, a better view of development in the region. So this one should go to North Africa. Let's see if I've got it pulled up over here. Yes, here we go. All right, so as we looked at before, GNI per capita and GDP are not always the best way to, to determine if a country is developing. And so there are other, uh, what many people would consider more important variables that may give us a better, uh, more holistic idea of, of the development of a region and countries within that region. So this is uh, GDP current. Um, as you can tell, uh, total GDP, gross domestic product, is often linked to population growth and so uh, you'll notice that there are some similar trajectories although uh, just like you saw in GNI you see a huge uh, drop in in GDP towards the 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16 and then boom and this is in specifically in Egypt. Now we also see that um, here is uh, in uh, Algeria as it booms and then 2014 uh, the Arab the Arab Spring conflicts. But anyways, there is a uh, obvious link between here and population growth and GDP uh, as is. Now this is uh, the results for the Middle East region, subregion. So this shows uh, GDP current and total population. You can also see in, in all of these countries there's uh, somewhat of a relationship there as well. And then of course here are the Arab states and you can see that same relationship existing here with Saudi Arabia at the top of the list and again Saudi Arabia at the top of the population list. Uh, but let's look at some of these other ones. So this is school enrollment. And so um, very different from some of the things we saw in South Asia and Southeast Asia. As you can see, school enrollment has not consistently increased in many of these countries. And in fact, they've take, taken tumbles over the years. 
And this is because of either internal strifes or outside intervention. You can see Morocco looked like it was, uh, it was improving and reforming pretty quickly up until 1984, and then we see a massive drop until 1992. Um, how, however, Sudan looks like it is improving uh, rather rapidly over the past few years. <clears throat> and then we can also look at poverty headcount ratio, largely because of the types of governments that exist in some of these places. There's not a lot of data, and so you have to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. We do have Egypt here. Uh, much of the poverty in Egypt has increased over the years, which is a, a, a bad sign. Um, South Sudan as well, South Sudan, and then of course Sudan uh, has increased in poverty headcount ratio as well. But if we look at Morocco, Algeria, there's just not enough data, so we can't really get a good, a good idea of poverty in these countries. However, in each one of the countries listed, life expectancy is increasing, so that implies that, that pe more people have access to modern medicine. And you can see some similar results here. Lack of data for poverty headcount ratio, school enrollment. Uh, some countries improved, but then uh, dramatically declined. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, and then um, uh, here's Syria, of course, uh, 2012, and this is uh, post-conflict between the U.S. and Syria. So it's hard to get a good handle. What it appears through the data that we're seeing here is that it's a tumultuous area that has seen some drastic improvements over the years, but recently has, has had some, well, in some cases expected, in other cases unexpected losses. Um, however, life expectancy is increasing across, across the, the region as well. So that's a good thing at least. All right, let's move this back over. So even though economic data suggests that many of these countries have declined recently, other data suggests that uh, things may not be as bad as they seem. Uh, so the question, next question is, what are the major industries in this region? and how do they impact development patterns in MENA? Now, agriculture still remains a major industry in MENA and the, industri the introduction of cash crops, such as cotton, has led to some diversification. Because there's a lack of industry, um, or a secondary sector for that matter, in many countries across the region, uh, some, some countries have instituted import substitution programs. Now, the primary sector dominates many of these countries, um, and oil extraction has led to a massive development in countries like Qatar, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain. Now, the growth of the petroleum industry in the region uh, has led to the creation of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Com uh, Countries, also known as OPEC. Now, however, many countries like the UAE are seeing diminishing returns on oil because of reduced reserves. Because of this, UAE has developed growing financial and tourist sector by reducing uh, capital regulations and building massive tourist sites. Now, these moves by Dubai and Abu Dhabi have attracted flight capital, which has helped to sustain their econ economy with the diminishing oil reserves. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So as stated before, agriculture is a major industry in MENA, but it is also a way of life for many people across the region. Now let's take a minute to look at uh, these links at the bottom uh, before we continue on this particular slide. So this will take us to this World Bank data over here. There we go. So uh, this first link, as you can tell here, uh, it shows World Bank data for agricultural employment in the countries of MENA. Now notice that South Sudan is the only country where a majority of its population works in the agricultural sector with 50.3%. 50, 50 now while this may be true, it is still a major industry in Sudan with 43% of the population working in agriculture. Now 37% of Moroccans and uh, 34 30, roughly 36% of uh, Yemeni's people, um, and again, 25% of people in Egypt work as farmers. Now, there are many reasons why these numbers are so high in these countries, 
And if you can remember back to the land use map that we looked at in the last presentation, these countries primarily depend on subsistence farming to feed their population. Now countries at the bottom of the list like Qatar, Bahrain, and Israel and Kuwait primarily import their food uh, from other MENA countries. Now, on the other hand, Israel has a large agricultural sector. However, most of their farming is highly mechanized, so a broad majority of their people work outside of agriculture. Let's go to this other uh, link over here. Now, this diagram shows the changes in agricultural employment in MENA compared to South Asia and East Asia and the Pacific over time. Now, as you can tell, agricultural employment uh, has followed the same trajectory that other regions have for MENA. Now, with the introduction of mechanized farming uh, and agribusiness in many of these countries, less people are working in agricultural today than really ever before. So we can go back to our slide here. I'm going to put Google Maps on. Now, okay, um, this slide says that MENA countries are major exporters of agricultural products to other MENA countries in Europe. They also import most of their food from the same countries. However, a major portion of agricultural production is informal pastoral agriculture, i.e. the Bedouins. Now the pie chart on the upper left, seen over here, shows MENA agricultural exports by destination. Now as of 2015, 40% of agricultural goods produced in this region uh, were exported to other MENA countries, as you can see here in the yellow. And uh, due to, largely due to proximity, 39% of agricultural goods were sent to Europe and Central Asia. Now the pie chart on the bottom left over here shows MENA agricultural imports by origin. In 2015, 31% of agricultural products were imported from East Asia. And uh, Pacific, uh, excuse me, and the Pacific, and 41% were imported from Europe and Central Asia. Now, this reflects the region's inability to feed its entire population with local and neighboring agriculture. While exports, uh, while it exports a lot of food to each other, MENA is highly dependent on outside regions for supplemental food. Now, the map on the top uh, top of the page over here shows. Uh, MENA agricultural systems by location. The light blue is irrigated lands. You can see that here along river systems. The dark green is uh, highland mixed agriculture. You can see up here and up here as well. Uh, the, the regular green or the true green, you can see in some of these locations like here where it says three, is uh, rain fed mixed agriculture and a lot of this is associated with agribusiness or major crop uh, production. And the light green is dry land mixed. And of course the dark tan, as you can see there's some linear occurrences here, uh, it represents pastoralism. Notice that major agriculture production is limited to rivers and coastlines with one exception and that's Iran, which has a highly efficient agricultural sector. Now pastoral peoples are essentially relegated to the desert and grassland regions. One example of the people tied to their historical pastoral culture are the Bedouins. So who are the Bedouins? So let's watch this short video from uh, Test Tube News titled, Who are the Bedouin Nomads of the Middle East? <laughs> In May of 2015, Israel's Supreme Court approved the demolition of a Bedouin village to make way for a new Jewish community. However, the United Nations has expressed concern that this controversial decision may constitute a human rights violation against what is already one of the poorest ethnic groups in the world. So who are the Bedouins, and what is their story? Well, the word Bedouin is a derivative of the Arabic word for nomad. They're an ethnic group known for roaming the deserts of the Middle East and North Africa, often with pastoral herds of goats and camels since as early as the 9th century BC. Today, many subscribe to the Sunni Islam faith. However, Bedouin culture is thought to predate the spread of Islam. Like many nomadic tribes, they live under a strict code of honor, which reportedly includes a form of lie detection that involves placing a hot spoon on the tongue of the alleged liar. 
They also have a well-defined hierarchy of loyalty, summarized by the widely quoted proverb, I against my brother, my brothers and I against my cousins, and then my cousins and I against strangers. As nomads, the Bedouins historically thrived by protecting and operating desert trade routes. However, in the last few centuries, the Bedouin way of life has changed. With the rise of the Ottoman Empire and modern government's emphasis on land ownership, much of the land that Bedouins used pastorally was no longer available. Many clans had no choice but to settle down and become semi-nomadic. One of the most prominent Bedouin clans settled in the Negev region of what is now Israel during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At the time, the newly formed Israeli government originally set aside specific land for the Bedouins. However, some groups settled on empty government property, sparking off intense territorial disputes that still continue today. Currently, there may be as many as three or four million Bedouins in the world, and the status of many of them, even outside of Israel, represents a murky political and social question. Many countries make efforts to preserve the ethnic group through aid programs, but they still face persecution and difficulty in gaining citizenship in some parts of the Middle East. If you're interested in learning more about lesser-known cultures around the world, make sure you check out our video on the Romani people, more commonly known as the Gypsies. So that's, that provides at least somewhat of an overview, so maybe we can get a better idea of where these people are located by checking out Bedouin maps. And we'll see if this actually shows anything. Unfortunately, because they are pastoral and semi-nomadic, we say semi-nomadic and pastoral, meaning they primarily live off of the land, very similar to Maasai people of Kenya and Tanzania. They depend heavily on cattle to feed their population, and they, but they also still participate in society, so it's not like they're leaving themselves out of normal societal interactions. But the broad majority of them exist in the Jordan, Israel, um, Lebanon, Syrian area. Some of them overlap into Iraq and then still more overlap into Saudi Arabia. And they largely live by their own customs and uh, have really a, a, an interesting history, much like the Kurds that live up here in northern Iraq and eastern Turkey. Okay, so what about industrial development in MENA? Now this slide says that several MENA countries such as Egypt had little industry after the European colonialism uh, ended, so they created subsidies and tariffs as a form of, quote, import substitution, um, i.e. goods are produced domestically rather than abroad. Many of these policies still exist today. Now this map is the located here is from the Heritage Foundation's Economic Freedom Index. Uh, it shows business freedom across the region. Now, business freedom refers to government regulations over business practices, uh, and this generally includes uh, tariffs on imports. As you can see, several countries such as Egypt, um, Algeria, and Kuwait. Um, across the region have re highly regulated markets with protectionist policies to promote domestic development. Now you'll notice that Libya here and Yemen and of course Lebanon are in the red. While this represents severe government control, these countries are currently in civil conflict, so this, is, this could be one of the reasons why business freedom is extremely low. Now this map shows the tax burden of each country in MENA. Unfortunately, this data is not always available, so that's why these countries, uh, so many of these countries are in gray. Notice that taxes are relatively low across the region except for Israel. Now this is part of their import substitution program and is meant to attract industries to these countries. Now many of these countries have also introduced tax subsidies for local industries as well. So let's take a look at this link uh, to the Heritage Foundation's website. Now, people are very opinionated, opinionated about the Heritage Foundation, so just keep that in mind that you have to take some of this information with a grain of salt uh, and that it is uh, highly subjective. So let's zoom in here to the Middle East and we can actually 
label those here, North Africa, Middle East, and you'll notice that a lot of data is not available. But we can go, uh, essentially this index, index is a series of measurements based on a scale of zero to one, uh, excuse me, zero to 100. Uh, they essentially create a percentage score and then multiply that times 100. So we have property rights and generally low property rights through many of these countries. A lot of the industries, a lot of the major commodity industries in some of these countries, especially Iran, uh, parts of Egypt, um, and Saudi Arabia are nationalized and so the government owns these these businesses and so it's very difficult for small businesses to enter into uh, some of these commodity exchanges. Recent reforms have uh, have been enacted in the United Arab Emirates and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, we also have problems with government integrity again a very subjective measurement because let's zoom out to the world United States appears pretty high on this list, and many would argue that the United States has very little government integrity. So just keep that in mind that some of this data is very subjective. And then we have tax burdens. So when we take this down, we notice that the tax burden is, is low in many of these countries as stated before. Um, we have high government spending in some areas. Oman has a, a very large welfare structure. We have uh, low fiscal health. Um, Iran has pretty good fiscal health because they don't they don't take out loans for the spending they they uh, for the spending that they participate in, and their oil and natural gas industry is nationalized, so they have total control over over income there. Uh, of course, business freedom we saw this one before. Labor freedom low in most of this area. Uh, monetary freedom. Uh, again, higher in many of these areas because they're attempting to, as, as oil reserves start to disappear, they're attempting to replace that with, uh, with international finance, all except for Iran, who tries to stay out of international finance. And of course, we have trade freedom. This is directly related to, to the import tariffs, which has a direct uh, impact on this import substitution program. Okay, so as stated earlier, oil is a major resource in much of the Middle East and North Africa. Now many of these countries have nationalized their oil reserves and used this income to implement government policies. Now because of the importance of oil in the region, the Organization for the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or called OPEC was created to set prices and ensure control of the international oil market. Now, as this slide says, the Organization for the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, is a cartel of oil producing countries found in 1960 at a conference in Baghdad. OPEC meets privately to set oil prices and control supply, hence the term cartel. Um, this artificially inflates the price of oil. Uh, many people have argued that peak oil will happen in a few years. They've been arguing this for, for several decades. But we don't really have any idea how much oil exists. Not only do they keep, does OPEC keep oil supplies low to ensure high returns, but in many cases OPEC has actually flooded the market to ensure that any competition is forced to shut down or sell out. Now this has happened quite a bit, especially lately. If uh, you look at the graph in the upper left, notice that the U.S. oil production surpassed both Saudi Arabia and OPEC uh, in production per day uh, back in December 2012. Now because of rising production of U.S. shell oil in 2014, Saudi Arabia flooded the market with cheap oil to put the private competitors in the U.S. out of business. In fact, Saudi Arabia flooded the market in February and March of this year for similar reasons, but different countries were involved. Uh, let's read, a, read this article from NPR titled, Oil Prices Stocks Plunge After Saudi Arabia Stuns the World with Massive Discounts. So uh, this article discusses something that is rather recent in, in uh, the news. Oil prices and stock indexes were in free fall Sunday after Saudi Arabia announced a stunning discount in oil prices of $6 to $8 per barrel to its customers in Asia, the United States, and Europe. 
Benchmark, uh, benchmark Brent crude oil futures dove 30%, the steepest drop since the Gulf War 1991, an early trading Sunday night before recovering slightly to a drop of 24%. The benchmark Brent crude oil price fell below $35 per barrel. Now this is important to note because uh, it was actually against the law prior to the 1990s, mid 90s for uh, investors to speculate on commodities. And then the commodities exchange was created. So now um, prices are not only controlled by the producers, but they're also controlled by speculators, which can be problematic sometimes. Um, hence why in 2000 and, uh, 2008, 9, and 10, oil prices drove up to the highest that they've ever been, making uh, gasoline in some places as high as seven or eight dollars a gallon. Now the oil price shocks reverberated throughout the financial markets. Dow futures dropped more than 1,000 points. S&P 500 futures hit their limits after tumbling 5% and the key 10-year treasury note yield fell below 5%, a record low. Now this is important 10-year treasury note. Why would it fall? Well, again, this is the petrodollar tied to the value of petroleum worldwide. And Saudi Arabia knows that they have that type of power. Saudi Arabia is the world's second largest producer. This weekend said it, was, uh, it will actually boost oil production instead of cutting it to stem falling prices in a dramatic reversal in policy. Late last week, Saudi Arabia, the rest of OPEC, and Russia failed to agree on production cuts to combat failing prices because of fears that the coronavirus epidemic will halt before uh, the, halt the world economic growth. Oil prices were down more than 30% this year before Sunday's collapse. U.S. consumers are likely to see lower prices at the gas pump, but American oil producers who lead the world in output could be hurt by the oil price slide. And so this stuff is done and managed on purpose. Sometimes OPEC does it as a group. Other times it's just Saudi Arabia behind this mess. Now you can read the rest of this article for yourself, npr.org, oil prices, stocks plunge after Saudi Arabia stuns world with massive discounts. Now, as you can tell from that article, OPEC is not always in solidarity. Saudi Arabia holds most of the cards and uses their supply of crude oil for their benefit, as stated earlier. Now, this, uh, the graph in the upper right shows crude oil production in 2014. Notice that Saudi Arabia produces more than two-thirds more oil than the next largest producers, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Of course, if you look at uh, the map on the bottom right over here, you'll notice that OPEC is not limited to MENA countries, but these countries do dominate the list. Venezuela is the only OPEC competition to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, as it is the, well, several years ago was the number one producer of oil in the world. Hence why Venezuela appears so important to the United States. It's not about freedom, people. All right, so while oil is a major commodity in MENA, there are limits to its production. One example of these limits is the United Arab Emirates and more specifically the city of Dubai. Now, beginning in 2013, uh, UA UAE's oil production began its slow decline um, as the Emiratis announced a, uh, announced a declining oil supply. Now, if you look at the graph in the upper right over here, uh, after 2013, oil exports began to decline arithmetically, as you can see here. Now, prior to this decline in exports, the Emirat, uh, Emirati of, of Dubai announced a plan to attract foreign direct investment in the financial sector and promote tourism to its beaches. Now, Dubai removed most of its financial regulations in banking, thereby attracting flight capital. Now, flight capital is money transferred abroad to avoid taxes or inflation, achieve uh, better investment on returns, or to provide for possible immigration. Not immigration, but immigration. So, attract people in the country. Now, Dubai also invested um, heavily in trade infrastructure as the Persian Gulf is a major traffic hub out of the Middle East. Let's look at a, uh, at a live shipping, uh, shipping crate map uh, by shipmap.org. We'll go to this pretty really quickly. And we've seen this before, so you'll this will be familiar to you. 
So yeah, I don't want to watch the video. All right, so this is a live shipping map and you can see the number of vehicles located here. As you can see on this map, ships are clustering around the UAE as it's uh, becoming a major fueling and stopping port for ships in and out of the Persian Gulf. Now you can go here to uh, ports. So let's see the major ports here. Abu Zabi, Dubai, um, Al Jazeera port. We can actually see the types of ships, ship type. And you can see that a uh, broad majority of these ships are liquids. And we can, we can kind of guess what types of liquids. Uh, they're more than likely oil, petroleum, or natural gas. Although we do have gas here in the green, and you can see those as well. Uh, these are dry ships, meaning they're, they're shipping in and out container vessels um, and other products. Now, Dubai, Dubai also began building tourist infrastructure to attract foreigners to their beaches. Now, they recently completed several palm-shaped islands, and as you can see over here in the bottom right, um, and are in the process of finishing a series of islands shaped like the world. Dubai also re recently completed the construction of the tallest building in the world, seen over here, called the Burj Khalifa. Now, let's look at Google Maps really quickly and... Uh, see if we can get a better view. I'll close some of these so it's not taking up as much space. Okay, so we zoom in over here to uh, the United Arab Emirates. And again, a broad majority of this area is desert, so that's that helps to explain why most of the major cities are located on the coastline. So here's Abu Dhabi, which is attempting to uh, to profit from uh, new tourism as well. But the Emirati of Dubai has really jumped on this as of late. So you can see here, this is the World Islands. Now, interestingly, David Beckham bought one of bought a plot of land on one of these islands. I don't know; it's not completed. So you may not be able to see much, but let's look here. So this is what the islands look like. And you can imagine <laughs> building a house on one of these islands. And you can see some of these smaller, uh, smaller homes on those islands as well. Now this is what's fascinating. This, uh, this is one of the completed Palm Islands and it's absolutely gorgeous. I actually had a friend that taught English as a second language in, in uh, Dubai and she loved it. She stayed there for years and she actually lived in one of these apartments here on the main, on the main drag on this, this Palm Island. They, they apparently value education much better than uh, do we. And I was actually surprised that they hired a, a, a female to teach English as a second language. But she loved it. Uh, she had to dress conservatively, but that was fine with her. Uh, she was she was never really much of a of a, a super snazzy dresser, anyways. But there is some amazing stuff going on here. Now, initially, when the construction began here, uh, the island started getting washed away by the waves. As you saw earlier, lots of ships travel through the Persian Gulf here, and it started washing away these these islands. And so the uh, the engineers later came back and established these breakwater islands, and uh, the popularity grew so so fast over these islands that what was meant to be a breakwater actually turned into part of the shopping centers. And so you can see uh, Aqua Adventure Water Park located here. Let's take a street view there, and you can see that. Uh, from the ground, you couldn't tell that this was man-made. And this has become a major hub for international tourism. And then if we go down to Dubai, their main downtown area, type in Burj Khalifa. Building is so tall that it uh, has trouble showing up correctly on Google 
maps. So let's see here. There it is. Currently the tallest building in the world. Now there are there is construction for a building that's even taller than this in Iraq, um, which will hopefully be completed sometime soon. This map stopped working, so we'll just do this. Okay. So uh, geography has also played a major role in social development in and political relations in MENA as well. Now, because of the nature of these topics, we don't really have enough time to discuss all of these points in great detail, so I will only briefly discuss each point. Now, religion plays a major role across MENA, as Islam is the major religion in every country except for Israel. Islam has also led to the spread of Arabic as a common language in many of these countries. Israel, Turkey, and Iran are the main countries that don't speak Arabic as their main language, but the broad majority of MENA countries use it as their official or at least their standard language. I'm going to reduce this back so we can still view this map over here. Now, gender differences have played a major role in the culture of the region as well, as women in many of these countries have very few civil rights. Now, I don't want to make it claim, make it seem like none of the countries have civil rights for women, uh, but it is uh, fairly common in many of these countries, specifically many of the Arab states. Uh, now, in fact, uh, several countries, such as these Arab states, practice a type of, uh, a form of Wahhabism and institute what are known as female seclusion policies. Now, because of the nature of environments of many of these countries, most people live in the cities near water resources. Now, there are two main city-states in the region, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Qatar. Now, other larger states also have primate cities that have developed due to powerful central governments, uh, dependency on primary export, and, of course, the legacy of colonialism. Now, because of historical development patterns, neocolonialism, and geographic location to strategic resources, this region has gone through a series of geopolitical struggles. The three main issues that we'll cover are uh, the Arab Spring, the stateless nation of Kurdistan, and the rise of terrorist organizations in the region. So, uh, because we discussed the history of Islam in the previous video, I won't go into much detail here, uh, so we'll just do a quick overview. Now, Islam is a monotheistic religion from the Ara Abrahamic tradition. In other words, its foundation principles are similar to that of Christianity and Judaism, as Muslims believe in one God named Allah, and believe in many of the original scriptures written in the Torah and the Bible. There are many differences, but for right now, understand that Islam is similar in many ways to other Abrahamic religions. Now, as discussed before, Islam was founded by Muhammad around 610 AD. Uh, today, Muslim, uh, Muslims um, believe, uh, well, they, they treat Muhammad as a prophet, um, that was brought to them by Allah, but refused to draw his face. Now, because Muslims do not want to idolize Muhammad, pictures of him are often uh, drawn with his face being whited out. So, Islam's most important holiday is Ramadan, celebrated on the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. The dates change each year because of it being part of this uh, Islamic calendar, so it will appear on different dates on our calendar um, throughout the years. Now, Islam's most important uh, religious location is the Great Mosque of the Kaaba in Mecca. Now, every year millions of people visit this site uh, on a Hajj, or a pilgrimage of prayer. Now, so let's watch this uh, short video from National Geographic about the Kaaba for some more information. Thank you. 
Mecca sits in the western mountains of Saudi Arabia, in a sanctuary roughly 100 miles square. Since long before Islam, it has been considered sacred territory, where no one could hunt, cut trees, or fight. At the heart of the city is a great mosque called Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and at its center is the Kaaba. Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. They worship what it represents, the one God. Hajj takes place in and around Mecca. It is a series of rituals performed between the 8th and 13th days of the last month of the Islamic calendar. While circling the Kaaba is the final act of the pilgrimage, it is also the top priority for pilgrims when they first get to Mecca. For Muslims who have prayed in this direction every day for years, seeing the Kaaba for the first time is almost overwhelming. Now to the Valley of Minna, where the Prophet Muhammad stopped and rested on his Hajj nearly 14 centuries ago. This is a town that grows from virtually zero to two million people overnight. At dawn on the next day, the camps stir with anticipation for the greatest day of the Hajj. Two million people are off to the plain of Arafat. Some 50,000 vehicles clog the roads. Arafat is eight miles east of Mina. It's the place, Muslims believe, Adam and Eve found each other after exile from Eden. And it's seen by many as a rehearsal for the Day of Judgment. It's Judgment Day. All the trappings of life sort of fall away and you see these people in front of God Almighty. And that's all there is. A strange quiet descends in the afternoon as people turn inward. It's called the standing at Arafat. Only when the sun has set can pilgrims leave Arafat. Nearly two million people stand poised to move as soon as the sun dips below the horizon. The pilgrims move back toward the white tents of Minna, where tomorrow they will engage in a symbolic battle with the devil. Here, Muslims believe, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, but the devil challenged him not to. One story says, Abraham pelted the devil with stones three separate times, chasing him away. Three stone pillars mark the spots where Abraham stood his ground. At a place called Muzdalifah, on the way to the pillars, pilgrims pick up pebbles to stone Satan themselves. The ritual is called the Jumrat. With all other rites complete, pilgrims return to Mecca for a grand parting visit. They have all earned an honorific title, Haji for the men, Haja for the women. Pilgrims arrive alone in a current of a million strangers and go home riding a spiritual wave of rebirth. Now, on an unfortunate side note, recent satellite images from the Kaaba. We'll take a look at that. Recent satellite image, Kaaba. And we can see this for ourselves. So this is what the Kaaba looks like on any given day, right here. But as you can see from this picture, just several, just two days after March 3rd, uh, very few people are in the Kaaba. And that's a very rare sight. And that's largely due to this recent COVID-19 virus, unfortunately. Now, Islam began its spread during the reign of Muhammad and expanded to its fullest extent under the Umayyad Caliphate, as stated in the previous video. Uh, the religion largely spread through what's known as contagious diffusion and by word of mouth. 
Now, contagious diffusion means that as one person begins practicing the religion, people they, uh, they come in contact with start practicing it as well. Now, eventually conquest would follow and many people were required to attend mosque. Now, this is another example of contagious diffusion. As more lands were conquered, the population would have to practice the religion. I'll make this site a little bit bigger so you can get a better view of, the, of these maps, which are pretty good maps, although they are um, far too aggregated, but they give you a good idea of location. Now, because of the diffusion of Islam across MENA, Arabs and their language came with it. These people intermarried and local with local populations and settled in these new lands. Nowadays, Arabic is the dominant language in North Africa and the Middle East, and Arabs are the dominant nationality across the region. Now, because of this spread, much of MENA is considered what's called a multi-state nation, which just means that the, the same nationality exists across country borders. Now, the map on the left here shows ethno-linguistic groups across Africa. Notice that Arabic in the yellow here dominates the landscape in North Africa. Now, the map on the right over here uh, is ethno-linguistic groups in the Middle East. Now, while Arabic is the dominant language uh, in the Arab states here, um, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkic, uh, and, and Turkic are uh, other, excuse me, let me rephrase. This, uh, while Arabic is the main language in many of these areas like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, other languages exist across the region as well, such as Turkic or Turkish here in Turkey. We also have Kurdish located here in what would be known as the stateless nation of Kurdistan. And then the major language, is, uh, language in Iran is Persian with a minor group of people, although it is a large minority of uh, Baluchis that, uh, that live along the southeastern portion of Iran. Now, notice that the slide says, contrary to popular belief, Semites uh, are not ethnically Jewish. Semitic is the name for a group of languages, including um, Arab, Amharic, Tigrinya, Hebrew, Tigri, Aramaic, Maltese as well. Now, these languages were spread by Phoenician traders in the classical era. So keep that in mind when we, when we use the word Semitic, it's in reference to a language group. So any of these languages that are located in North Africa that's, that are Arab or Arabic, they are Semitic and they're just as Semitic as Hebrew located in Israel. Now, because one religion and culture dominates much of this region, many of these countries participate in uh, similar cultural practices for obvious reasons. Now, one example is female seclusion. In many of the Arab Peninsula states, um, also, uh, also called the Gulf states, uh, many of these countries require women to stay out of public view, i.e. female seclusion, and be educated separately from men. However, some things are improving. Now, the graph at the bottom left shows the percentage of women in the labor force. Now, while MENA is at the bottom of the list, located here, um, the percentage has increased from 19% in 2000 to 20%, 22% in 2016. Now, literacy rates shown here in the bottom middle of the slide uh, are also increasing in the region, and the number of seats held by national parliament, shown here in this graph, are increasing in many of these countries as well. Now, uh, Bahrain is, is, is essentially the quintessential city-state with 100% of its population living in only one city, as you can see here. Now, this is a small island nation that made its wealth on oil, but much like Singapore has moved to the financial services in recent years. Now, Qatar, located here, and Kuwait, Kuwait located here, aren't really by definition city-states because their territory is large enough to have other settlements uh, than just the capital. However, a majority of their people live in these capital cities, as you can see from the picture um, here of uh, Kuwait and the picture of here of Doha, Qatar. 
Now, these states have also built their wealth on oil and uh, now participate in financial industries as well. Here, let's fix that. There we go. That's better. Now, in 2010, a series of major conflicts occurred across several countries in MENA. The Arab Spring was sold by Western media as, uh, as the people rising up against the evil dictators and instituting democracy. Now, some countries such as Morocco and Jordan were unable were able to avoid total collapse by instituting some civil reforms, as you can see uh, labeled here in light red, Morocco and Jordan. Now, however, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, and Syria went into total civil war, and many of these governments were toppled. Infamously, the U.S. consulate at Benghazi, located in Libya, uh, was uh, was attacked by an armed militia and U.S. diplomat uh, Christopher Stevens was killed. Immediately, the State Department under the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton blamed the attack on a racist video about Muhammad. Now, of course, information later came out from WikiLeaks revealing that the State Department refused to provide backup when Ambassador Stevens requested it several days prior to the attack. Other information showed that the State Department knew the attack was imminent and Ambassador Stevens was a loose end. Uh, WikiLeaks documents also found that the rebels that attacked the embassy were armed and supplied by U.S. attaches in Libya. So where is Benghazi? Now Benghazi is or should be a major port city but located here off the coast of Libya. And of course, Tripoli is the capital city. And this is an important shipping area. Libya should be wealthy. And in fact, it uh, was becoming wealthier until this Arab Spring. Unfortunately, the Arab Spring would not only come in contact with Libya, but it would also impact other places as well. Um, Back to Libya, um, after the consulate was destroyed, the leader of Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, was assassinated with a shot to the head and stored in a freezer for people to view. He wasn't killed by freedom fighters as stated by the news. He was killed by U.S. supplied terrorist groups in Libya. Now this was not limited to Libya as said before. Now many of these groups stormed palaces in Tunisia and Egypt, backed by U.S. weapons and artillery. These same groups destroyed countless Roman, Greek, and Phoenician artifacts across the region. Now, Yemen is still being bombed by Saudi Arabia using weapons provided by the U.S. In fact, in several circumstances, U.S. US produced and manufactured drones and missiles have been used to blow up hospitals, primary schools, and even school buses. Now, the, their problems have been exasperated by uh, increasing U.S. sanctions and blockades uh, that have essentially kept humanitarian from coming in, humanitarian aid from coming in. Now, Syria is another case, but they have held. Uh, they have fortunately for them have had the help of Russia since the end of the Iraq War in the mid 2000s. The United States has funded uh, has funded moderate quote unquote moderate rebels to the tune of billions of dollars in weapons. However, these groups aren't moderate. FBI documents have shown that these moderate rebels are actually part of terrorist group, uh, the terrorist group called ISIL, ISIS, or Islamic State. Now, this particular group uh, out of Syria also goes by the name of Al Nusra. In other words, the Arab Spring was a farce and resulted in the destruction of several MENA countries and created open air slave markets in places like Libya here. The United States and Saudi Arabia, Arabia continue to fund many of these groups, even to this day. All right, another major geopolitical issue is Kurdistan. Kurdistan is a stateless nation that exists across Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. Now, when the Sykes-Picot Agreement was enacted after World War I, Britain's, uh, Britain purposely purposefully left the Kurds out of the deal. The geographic divide and conquer technique has made it impossible for the Kurds to have any autonomy. Now this region is also rich in natural gas and the Kurds have 
very little ownership over the operations to extract this resource. Kurdistan is a stateless nation, meaning that it is a nation of people with a historical tie to, the, to this land, but they have no formally recognized government. It also uh, it is also the largest stateless nation in the world. Now, the U.S. claims to be allies with the Kurds against terrorist groups in the region, but they have uh, been largely silent over the issue of sovereignty. To this day, Kurdistan remains in a constant struggle with Turkey and Iraq over sovereign control of its territory. Now, the final issue that we will discuss is the creation and rise of terrorism in the Middle East. In the early 1980s, the CIA worked with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and the Saudi royal family to, cre to create a militia uh, that would fight a guerrilla-style war against the Soviets in northern Afghanistan. Now, this group became known as Al-Qaeda. Uh, this roughly translates into, quote, the database, because that was the name that the CIA file folder uh, was given by the CIA. Now, Al-Nusra Al is Al-Qaeda in Syria and, fund, and is funded by the U.S. and U.K. to fight against Bashir al-Assad in Syria. ISIL or ISIS or Islamic State is just another name for Al-Nusra in Syria, which is funded by the U.S. and U.K. Now, there are several important articles about the subject that uh, we can look at, but for now, let's just look at these two in the top right of the slide. From Salon, we'll make this a little bit bigger, titled, We Created Islamic Extremism, Those Blaming Islam for ISIS Would Have Supported Osama Bin Laden in the 80s. Jingoists conveniently forget the West's Cold War strategy was to arm the Islamic extremists, extremists that became Al-Qaeda. Uh, history takes no prisoners. It shows that with absolute, with absolute lucidity that the Islamic extremism ravaging the world today was born out of the Western foreign policy of yesteryear. Gore Vidal famously referred to the U.S. as the United States of Amnesia. The late Chinese premier Zhou Enlai put it a little more delicately, delicately, delicately quipping, one of the delightful things about Americans is that they have absolutely no historical memory. Um, in order to understand the, the rise of militant Salafi groups like uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, in order to wrap our minds around their heinous, abominable actions and attacks on civilians in the U.S., France, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Nigeria, Turkey, Yemen, Afghanistan, and many, many more countries, we must rekindle this historic memory. Where did violent extremism come from? In the wake of the horrific Paris attacks in, on Friday, November the 13th, this is the question no one is asking. Uh, yet it is yet it is the importance uh, the most important one of all it doesn't uh, if one doesn't know why a problem emerged if one cannot find its roots one will never be able to solve and uproot it where did the militant Salafi groups uh, like ISIL ISIS uh, and Al Qaeda come from the answer is not as complicated as many make it out to be but to understand we must delve into the history of the Cold War war the historical period lied about in the West perhaps more than any other. Um, this is a great article. I suggest you read this for more information. Um, I'm going to have to stop here because I've already somewhat covered this. Uh, but please go, uh, Salon doesn't have a lot of great articles, but this one is a really good one. Uh, titled, We Created Islamic Extremism. Those Blaming Islam for ISIS Would Have Supported Osama Bin Laden in the 80s. Let's go back to the slide over here and take a look at this one from The Guardian. Now this is an opinion article titled, Now the Truth Emerges, How the U.S. Fueled the Rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. The sectarian uh, terror group won't be defeated by the Western states that incubated it in the first place. Um, let me close that out of the way. The, terror, the war on terror, that campaign, campaign, uh, that campaign without end launched 14 years ago by George Bush is tying itself up in every uh, even ever more grotesque contortions. On Monday, the trial in London of a Swedish man, uh, Berlin Gildo, accused of terrorism in Syria, collapsed after it became clear British intelligence had been arming the same rebel groups the defendant was charged with supporting. The prosecution abandoned the case, apparently to avoid embarrassing the intelligence services. Defense argued that going ahead with the trial would have been an affront to justice when there was plenty of evidence that the British state was itself providing extensive support to the armed Syrian opposition. That didn't, that didn't only include, uh, this, is not, this is poor writing, that didn't only include the non-lethal assistance boasted of by the government, uh, but training, logistical support, and the secret 
supply of arms on a massive scale. Reports were cited that MI6 had cooperated with the CIA on a rat line of arms transfers from Libya stockpiles to the Syrian rebels in 2012 after the fall of the Gaddafi regime. Now again, you can check this article out uh, titled, uh, it's from the Gar London Guardian, Now the Truth Emerges, how's the, How the U.S. Fueled the Rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Truth is stranger than fiction. So let's take a look at this uh, map on the bottom right. ISIS was a major force in 2015, but by 2018, its territory was reduced by 80%. Now this is largely due uh, to attacks by the Iraqi, uh, Syria, uh, and Russian and Iranian military forces. But the important question is why was Syria so important that the US would fund al-Nusra in Syria? Uh, now prior to the conflict in Syria, uh, the U.S. met with Syrian President Bashir al-Assad to plan the construction of an oil pipeline with Syria to Europe. Now shortly after this meeting, Russia met with Syria for the same reason but had different plans. Now this map shows uh, US, the U.S. plan in blue, located here, um, and the Russian plan in red, located here. The U.S. plan would transport oil from Qatar uh, through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, and into Europe through Turkey, which is a major NATO ally. Now, the Russian plan would transport natural gas from Iran through Kurdistan and into Syria for transportation out of the main deep water port here in Syria. As you could probably guess, Syria chose the Russian plan. Now the U.S. couldn't let that happen, so a series of stories began to appear claiming that Assad was gassing his own people. Later research by the uh, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or the OPCW, found that the Syrian government did not gas its people. This report wasn't released until the election of Donald Trump and received condemnation from the Trump administration. Now, of course, it was largely ignored by the media. The latest report, released in 2019, took back earlier statements and claimed Assad did not use chlorine gas in Idlib. Now, WikiLeaks documents surfaced later in 2019, revealing that the initial data showed no evidence of chlorine gas being used by, uh, but the editors of the report changed the document to say that chemical weapons were used. Several scientists that worked for the OPCW came out and stated that, the, that their data had been manipulated to push an agenda. All in all, the Syrian conflict was another farce perpetuated by the U.S. government for control over oil in the region. Okay, uh, that's about it for us today. We'll cut it here. Thanks for watching and stay healthy and have a great day.